Hello and welcome to Daily News Simplified, an answer to what, why and how of newspaper analysis from the UPSC perspective. Today we have taken up important articles from the Hindu newspaper. Topics which we are going to discuss are displayed on your screen. Let's begin the discussion. Now let's start with the first article which appeared on page number 8, Hindu newspaper. This article talks about aspects related to simultaneous polls. Now the context of this article is that union government recently set up a committee under the leadership of the former president of India, Ramnath Kovind, to look into the feasibility of simultaneous polls to states, assemblies and the Lok Sabha. So eight member high level committee is set to examine one nation, one election idea and make recommendations for holding simultaneous elections in the country. Now simultaneous elections in India is quite important from the perspective of GS paper too. Why? Because it involves governance reforms, constitutional aspects, federalism, political parties and electoral reforms among others. So its connection with multiple themes makes it quite important from the UPSC perspective. So now let's first understand what is simultaneous elections. Now the concept of one nation and one election envisions a system in which all states and Lok Sabha election that is parliamentary election must be held simultaneously and that is typically once every five years. So what will happen? This will entail restructuring the Indian election cycle so that elections to the states and center coincide. Now this means that voters will vote for members of the Lok Sabha and state legislative assemblies on the same day and at the same time or in a phased manner as the case may be. Now let's understand this with the help of an example. In the current electoral system in India, election happens throughout the year. For instance, Lok Sabha elections are held every five years and state assembly elections occur at different times for each state and typically every five year but not synchronized with Lok Sabha elections. For example, consider the state of Uttar Pradesh. Uttar Pradesh has 403 legislative assembly seats and Lok Sabha elections are held once every five years for 80 parliamentary constituencies in the state. So in this scenario, Uttar Pradesh witness elections almost every year which can be a logistically financial and administrative challenge. So under the concept of simultaneous elections, all elections in Uttar Pradesh whether for state assembly or Lok Sabha would be held together once every five years. This would mean that voters in Uttar Pradesh would cast their ballots for both state and national representatives on the same day. So this is all about the concept of simultaneous elections. Now let's see the history of simultaneous elections in India. Now the first general elections of free India held simultaneously to the Lok Sabha and the legislative assemblies of the state in year 1951. And the next three cycles of elections also witnessed concurrent Lok Sabha and legislative assembly elections barring a few stray cases. For example, Kerala, where a midterm election was held in year 1960 on the premature dissolution of the assembly. Another case is of Nagaland and Pondicherry, where the assembly was created only after 1962 general elections. And the last occasion where we had near simultaneous election was in year 1967. Now here you must be curious to know about the beginning of the end of simultaneous elections. Now let's look into this. Now fourth Lok Sabha constituted in year 1967 was dissolved prematurely in year 1971. This was the beginning of the end of simultaneous elections. Extension of the term of Lok Sabha during the national emergency declared in year 1975 and the dissolution of assemblies of some states after the 1977 Lok Sabha election further disturbed the cycle of concurrent elections. So this is all about the end of simultaneous election. Now what is the current status? Currently, we have at least two rounds of assembly general elections every year. Now recently we have seen many articles based on simultaneous elections and this is all about the idea of returning to simultaneous elections. But this is not something new. The idea of returning to simultaneous elections was raised in the election commission's annual report 
in year 1983. It was also mentioned in the Law Commission's report headed by Justice B. V. Jeevan Reddy in year 1999. Following the Prime Minister of India's reintroduction of the India in 2016, Niti Aayog prepared a working paper on the subject in year 2017. After that, Law Commission stated in its 2018 working paper that at least five constitutional recommendations would be required to make simultaneous election a reality in India again. Further, in June 2019. PM Modi said that a committee would be formed to examine the issue and a meeting with leaders of political parties would be called and in July 2022 the issue of holding simultaneous parliamentary and assembly elections has been referred to the law commission in order to develop a workable roadmap and framework so this is all about idea of returning to simultaneous elections now here Let's have a quick look on what all the important articles need to be amended for the implementation of simultaneous elections. Now article 172 and article 83 deal with the duration of the Houses of Parliament and guarantee a five term to both the elected Lok Sabha and the state assemblies unless they are dissolved sooner. Another important article is Article 85 of the Indian Constitution which deals with the powers of the president to summon parliamentary sessions not exceeding a gap of more than 6 months. The president also carries the power to adjourn either house of the parliament and dissolution of the Lok Sabha. Then another important article is Article 356 which comes into action in case of governance and constitutional failure in a state and deals with the president's rule. Also amendments in the People's Representation Act 1951 and anti defection law must be made for organized conduct and stability in both lok sabha and state assemblies so all these are important articles which need to be amended for the implementation of simultaneous elections now further let's look into the benefits of simultaneous elections now the first benefit is reduction in cost now as you know multiple elections at different time leads to a He huge cost to the exchequer in the form of lost time, labor, and financial cost. So simultaneous elections would mean saving on transport, accommodation, storage arrangements, training, remuneration, and so on. Now, second benefit is engagement of security forces. Now, as you know, deployment of security forces is normally throughout the elections, and frequent elections take away. a portion of such armed forces which could otherwise be better deployed for other internal security purposes for example in 2014 lok sabha elections which held along with state assembly elections in odisha andhra pradesh sikkim and arunachal pradesh was spread over 10 phases and 177 in situ companies and 1349 mobile companies of central armed police force were deployed so simultaneous elections can solve this problem another one is the policy paralysis that results from the imposition of the modal code of conduct during election time if all elections are held in one particular year it will give a clear four years to the political parties to focus on good governance Next is impact on delivery of essential services. Now regular elections hamper the delivery of essential services due to the engagement of public servants including a large number of teachers in the election process. Another benefit is voter turnout. Now according to law commission simultaneous polls will boost voter turnout. So these all are the benefits of simultaneous elections. Now having seen the benefits let's see few challenges associated with simultaneous elections now the first challenge is constitutional challenge now indian constitution provides for the dissolution of the legislature if the ruling party loses majority by passing a vote of no confidence that is clause 2 of article 83 and article 172 of indian constitution deals with the term of lok sabha and state assemblies respectively now these houses can be dissolved at the end of the 
scheduled expiry of the term of 5 years as per article 85 clause 2 section b and article 174 clause 2 b however there is no provision for the extension of the term unless a proclamation of emergency is in operation so bringing the terms of all the houses to sync with one another necessarily calls for either extending the terms of several of the houses or curtailing of terms or a combination of both that too by 2 to 3 years in some cases so in such a case simultaneous elections could not be held within the existing framework of the constitution so these could be held together through appropriate amendments to constitution then representation of the people act 1951 and rules of procedures of lok sabha and state assemblies and since it will affect the federal character at least 50% of the states will require to ratify the constitutional amendments so this is about constitutional challenge now let's see legal safeguards needed to avoid midterm dissolution now even if the terms are synchronized as one time measure we will still need adequate legal safeguards to avoid midterm dissolution so for maintaining the electoral cycle some countries have legal provisions for example no confidence motion to be brought up against the government in office now the proposed resolution should also contain a constructive vote of confidence in an alternative government with a named leader to head it next challenge is that it will affects judgments of voters that is national and state issues are different and holding simultaneous elections is likely to affect the judgment of voters for example available evidence particularly from the uk brazil argentina canada us and europe suggest that simultaneous elections yield more aligned results between national and regional elections another challenge is reduce accountability of government now since elections will be held once in 5 years it will reduce the government accountability to the people repeated elections keep legislators on their toes and increase accountability next challenge is logistical issue now in terms of resource allocation that is in terms of manpower preparing electoral rolls conducting simultaneous election will be a challenge for the election commission of india for example simultaneous conduct of elections would require large scale purchases of electronic voting machines and voting verifiable paper audit trail machines so for conducting simultaneous election commission expects that a total of rupees 9284.15 crore will be needed for procurement of evm and voter verifiable paper audit trail the machines would also need to be replaced every 15 years which would again entail expenditure so further storing these machines would increase the warehousing cost so these all are challenges associated with simultaneous elections now having seen the challenges and benefits associated with simultaneous election let's see a few futuristic solution the first in this is recommendation of parliamentary standing committee on law and justice according to this there should be a two phase election schedule and according to which elections to some legislative assemblies whose term end within 6 months to 1 year before or after the election date could be held during the mid term of lok sabha and for the rest of the states election could be held along with general elections to lok sabha another solution is that expense can be brought under control by ensuring that the legal cap on the expenditure of candidates is followed by all parties so these are the two solution for the challenges associated with simultaneous elections so now having seen benefits challenges and way forward in last we can say that law commission's recommendation suggests that there is a feasibility to restore one nation one election concept as it existed during the first two decades of india's independence however there need to be a consensus on which the country needs one nation one pool or not now our next discussion is based on this article which appeared on page number 7 in the hindu newspaper 
This article is about the recent National Higher Education Qualifications Framework that is NHEQF and the difficulties in implementing the NHEQF that is National Higher Education Qualifications Framework. Now as you can see that this article revolves around the theme education and here education is one of the theme under GS paper 2 which is quite important for your prelims as well as for your mains examination. As question based on objectives of population education came in year 2021 and the question based on digital initiatives in India contributed to the functioning of education system in India came in 2020. This theme is equally important from the prelims perspective as this question based on education came in year 2012. Now let's start with what is NHEQF. Now this NHEQF aim to facilitate transparency and comparability of higher education qualifications at all levels. The framework has been issued for all educational institutes to adopt. Now the purpose of the framework is to recognize and accredit qualifications offered by different types of institutions engaged in higher education, including vocational education, training, technical and professional education in India as envisaged in the National Education Policy 2020. It also aims to provide points of reference when setting and assessing academic standards, designing curricula, teaching learning assessment strategies and periodic review of programs. Also, this framework acts as an instrument for the development classification and recognition of qualifications along with continuum of levels from 4.5 to 8 with levels 1 to 4 in school education and each level is structured on the defined learning outcomes that is statement of what the learner is expected to know understand or be able to do on the successful completion of an approved program of study learning at a specified level now you might be understood that National Higher Education Quality Framework is trying to solve some of the pertinent issues in the education industry. So in this context, let us understand issues faced by the education sector. So the first issue is expenditure on education. The improvement of India's educational system requires more funding. According to Economic Survey 2022 and 23, the budgetary allocation for education as a percentage of total expenditure has dropped over the past seven years from 10.4% to 9.5%. Now, as you know, National Education Policy 2020 calls for public investment on education to 6% of GDP. And India's education budget has never touched this number yet. As per Economic Survey 21 to 22, Expenditure on education as a percentage of GDP was 2.8 percent between 2019 to 20, 3.1 percent between 20 to 21, 3.1 percent between 21 to 22. So with this, you can make it out that India's education budget has never touched this number yet. That is 6 percent of GDP. Now, second problem is infrastructure facilities. Now, poor building conditions such as leaking toilets. Smelly cafeterias, broken furniture, classrooms that are too hot or cold, moldy walls and plaster falling off ceilings make students feel negatively about their school norms and expectations. And this negative perception of the school's social climate contributes to high absenteeism and in turn that contributes to low test scores and poor academic achievement. And this problem is reason for another issue that is high dropout rate. Now what is dropout rate? It is measured in terms of percentage of students who leave school before completing their level or grade. It is a critical indicator of the effectiveness of the education system. This you can understand with the help of fact that according to UDI SC Plus 2021-22 to data reveals that the overall dropout rate in school in India is 1.5% which is lower than the previous year rate of 1.8%. However, this rate is still a concern, especially in certain states. Another problem is student-teacher ratio. Now, pupil-teacher ratio at different levels of education show availability of adequate number of teachers for teaching children 
enrolled at different grade. So increase in number of teachers in schools is contributing to focused delivery of education. The country has witnessed substantial reduction in pupil-teacher ratio over the last one decade. According to Ministry of Education, in primary schools, the pupil-teacher ratio was at 43 in 2010 to 11 and this has come down to 26.3 percent in 20 to 21 while in upper primary school the pupil teacher ratio has reduced from 33 in year 10 to 11 to 18.9 between 2020 to 21 next challenge is learning gap now students in all grades encountered learning gaps or learning losses despite an immediate switch to online schooling during COVID-19 pandemic. Less than 50% of kids have been able to handle studying during the past two years according to Learning Loss Education Recovery Loss 2022 report by Smile Foundation. And according to this report, school closures hindered students from developing social skills. Now the next issue is Poor quality education. Now, poor quality education is leading to poor learning outcomes in India, ultimately pushing children out of education system and leaving them vulnerable to child labor, abuse and violence. Many classrooms continue to be characterized by teacher-centered rote learning, corporal punishment and discrimination. Another challenge is neglecting practical knowledge. Now, educational institutions in India often neglect the importance of practical experiences. Studies are mostly focused on providing students with theoretical knowledge which affects their ability to use the knowledge they gain in the right way. So these are important issues in education system in India. Now having seen the issues in Indian education system, let's see a few suggestions. The first in this is quality of education. It is necessary to take measures to uniformly raise the standard of education in India so that everyone has access to fair and impartial information and growth possibility. Second suggestion is to fill vacancies. Government must make sure that vacancies are filled by giving institution more autonomy. The next suggestion is to upgrade curriculum. The curriculum was to be upgraded to meet the evolving and changing needs of the students. So as we have already discussed about learning loss, so learning loss recovery programs have to be included within the curriculum. Some schools even incorporate health curriculum to make health education an important part of formal learning. Second suggestion is upskilling and reskilling of teachers. By understanding the pace of advancement in technology, and the emergence of new age pedagogy, upskilling and reskilling are going to be the norm even in the years ahead. And in this regard, NCRT has developed performance indicators for elementary school teachers. And this is a framework for assessing teacher performance and providing constructive feedback for further improvement. Another suggestion is to reduce dropout. And this can be achieved by multiple coordinated efforts. For example, midday meal scheme and digital india next suggestion is to promote universal access to primary education and to achieve this we have sarva siksha abhyan which was launched in year 2021 it focuses on improving school access enrollment and retention by providing infrastructure teacher training and other support another suggestion is to promote universal access to secondary education and to achieve this, we have RMSA, that is Rashtriya Madhyamik Siksha Abhyan. This program focuses on improving infrastructure, teacher training, and quality of education in secondary schools. Then next is public-private partnership model. This model should be taken into consideration because the PPPs that are well designed can produce innovative school system in India. Then next is assess learning achievement of children and in this regard national surveys are carried out by ncrt to assess learning achievement of children in classes third fifth eighth and tenth also government of india has decided to participate in program for international students 
assessment that is PISA to be conducted by the OECD. Next suggestion is evaluation of schools. In order to objectively evaluate the performance of the school education system in the state, Ministry of Human Resource Development has designed 70 indicators based matrix to grade the states or UTs. Another initiative in this regard is Shala Siddhi and it is a school standards and evaluation framework developed by National Institute of Educational Planning and Administration which enables the school to self-evaluate based on seven key domains. And the last suggestion is proper implementation of National Education Policy 2020. This is the third in the series of National Education Policies. NEP 2020 seeks to address the entire education system in the country from preschool to doctoral studies and from professional degrees to vocational training. Now let's quickly understand the recommendations for school education in NEP 2020. It focuses on easier board exam, reduction in the syllabus to retain core essential and focuses on experimental learning and critical thinking. Another important feature is that in a significant shift from 1986 policy which pushed for 10 plus 2 structure of school education, this NEP proposes 5 plus 3 plus 3 plus 4 design corresponding to the age groups. Now this is for 3 to 8 years and this is known as foundational stage. This one is for 8 to 11 years and this is known as preparatory stage. This is for 11 to 14 years and this is known as middle stage. And this one is for secondary stage that is between 14 to 18 years. Now this brings early childhood education also known as preschool education for children of 3 to 5 years under formal schooling. Another important feature is it also proposes the extension of right to education to all children up to age of 18 years. Also, a new school curriculum will be introduced in the schools of a new national curricular framework for education that is NCFSE which will be undertaken by the NCRT. Last but not the least, one of the most important recommendation is that the policy proposes that students until class 5 should be taught in their mother language or regional language. Now recommendations in NEP have different timelines as the policy is made for next 20 years. Therefore, the implementation of NEP is being carried out in a phased manner. Indian education system has already passed through many success and failures. National Education Policy 2020 may bring watershed changes in educational landscape of India. Having said that, it all depends on its implementation and coordinate efforts by the various stakeholders. Inclusive and quality education was mentioned in SDG Goal 4 and it should be target for Indian education system as it is indispensable component to harness the potential of demographic dividend. Now our last discussion is based on this article which appeared on page number 4 in the Hindu newspaper. Context of this article is that Maharashtra Assembly Speaker has recently said that he will not delay the decision regarding the disqualification pleas against Shiv Sena MLAs but won't rush in either as it could result in the miscarriage of justice. Now as you know, Speaker is the key component of Parliament and State Legislature which is one of the important theme under GS Paper 2. Also, this theme is quite important from the mains perspective as there was a question based on the same came in year 2021. So in this discussion, we'll talk about role of speaker, then we'll discuss position of speaker in Britain and what is the role of speaker in India. These facts are quite important from the prelims point of view. Then in later part of our discussion, we'll talk about mechanisms to ensure the neutrality of speaker in India and issues associated with the speaker and we'll end our discussion with a way forward. So this section is quite important for your mains examination. So now let's begin our discussion. Now before coming to role of speaker, first you should know why his role of speaker is so important. Securing the neutrality of the speaker is a question that experts in India have been grappling with over 60 plus years. Watchful parliament forms the foundation of a well-functioning democracy. So the presiding officers of parliament are key to securing the effectiveness of this 
institution. The MPs look to them to facilitate, debate, protect their rights and uphold the dignity of parliament. So to have a watchful parliament, presiding officer is important. Now, our next question is, what is the position of speaker in Britain? In Britain, the promise of continuity in office for many terms is used to ensure the speaker's impartiality. So here, by convention, speaker also gives up the membership of his or political party, which is not the case in India. Now, let's come to the next question that is, what is the role of the speaker in India? In India, Speaker of the Lok Sabha or State Legislative Assembly holds several powers. Like, first in this is presiding officer. The Speaker presides over the meetings of the Lok Sabha or State Legislative Assembly, maintains order and decorum in the House, ensure that the proceedings are conducted in accordance with the rules and procedures. Next is decision making. Speaker decides on the admissibility of questions, motions, amendments also decides on the allocations of time for discussions and debates. Next is committee formation. Speaker appoints the members and chairpersons of various parliamentary committees such as committee on public accounts, committee on estimates and the committee on privileges. Next is casting vote. What is this? In case of a tie during a voting, speaker has the power to cast the deciding vote. Next is disqualification of members. Speaker has the power to disqualify a member of the Lok Sabha or State Legislative Assembly on the ground of defection, misconduct or violation of parliamentary rules. So if there's a question that who has the power to disqualify a member of Lok Sabha on the grounds of defection. And there are two options, President and Speaker. So the right answer is Speaker, who has the power to disqualify a member of the Lok Sabha on the grounds of defection. Now moving on to the next point, that is maintenance of order. The Speaker has the power to suspend or expel a member who violates the rules of the House or behaves in a disorderly manner. Next is role with respect to parliamentary affairs. Speaker is responsible for the administration of the Lok Sabha or State Legislative Assembly including the preparation of the annual budget, allocation of funds, recruitment of staff. So here we can see Speaker of the Lok Sabha or State Legislative Assembly plays a crucial role in ensuring the smooth functioning of the parliament or state and maintaining the integrity of the democratic process in India. Now, let's see what are the mechanisms to ensure the neutrality of speaker in India. First in this is that they are charged on the Consolidated Fund of India. Now, what does it mean? That salaries and allowances of speaker are fixed by Parliament. Next is, his work and conduct cannot be discussed and criticized in Lok Sabha or in State Legislative Assembly except or now. Next is, power of regulating procedure or conducting business or maintaining order in the house are not subject to the jurisdiction of any court. Another mechanism to ensure the neutrality of speaker in India is casting vote because he only exercises a casting vote in the event of tie. This makes the position of speaker impartial. Also, he is given a very high position in the order of precedence. He is placed at the 7th rank along with the CJI of India. Now having discussed the role of the speaker in India and the mechanisms to ensure the neutrality of speaker in India, let's discuss few issues associated with speaker. The first in this line is that there is no security in the continuity of the office. What does it mean that speaker is dependent on his or her political party for re-election? This makes the speaker susceptible to pulls and pressure from her or his political party in the conduct of the proceedings of the house. Next is persistence of allegations of prejudice. Now as you know that there has been a tradition of appointing the speaker from the majority party and the deputy speaker from the opposite side that is opposition side which has led to structural problems. Another issue is that there is no convention of speakers relinquishing their party membership and hence, they are often perceived as being partisan. Next, it is common for Indian speakers to have occupied ministerial roles shortly before or after their term. So as a result, if there is no evidence to substantiate such allegations, so it is not unexpected for speakers in India to be accused of 
partisanship. Another issue is anti-defection law assigns the responsibility of deciding whether a member should be disqualified to the speaker who has a significant discretion. However, this discretion has often been exploited by the ruling party to eliminate dissenting voices. Next issue is determination of money bill. Now it has been criticized for certifying bills such as Aadhaar bill as money bill though it may not have met the strict criteria laid out in the constitution. So these are the few issues associated with speaker. Now let's see what is advisable to overcome such issues. So first way forward in this regard is the responsibility of the speaker in dealing with defections, splits, mergers should be assigned to an impartial entity such as election commission or a neutral body outside the legislature. Second is to ensure a smooth and uncontested re-election process, it is recommended to establish a tradition of re-electing the speaker without any opposition. Next is during parliamentary discussions and question hour, efforts should be made to allocate time to members based on party strength and also to accommodate those who wish to express diverse concerns or viewpoints. Next is, in order to enhance trust in speaker's decision-making process, it is advisable to increase transparency by making the speaker's decision publicly available. And last but not the least, reluctance of a speaker to take action against disorderly members should be mitigated if the media play a constructive role in highlighting instances of misconduct and their negative impact on the house performance.